All right. Oop, wrong button. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you are, my friends. Uh, welcome to today's uh, live stream where we're going to dive into GDevelop and uh, discuss how to make games in GDevelop 5. And today we're going to be focusing on um, converting a script that I currently have running for uh, a super, super ghost or super toast world. Eight, uh, uh, Ramit, how's it going? Eighteen thirty-four for you there. It is currently not uh, zero nine thirty-seven. Is morning for me on uh, March twenty-seventh here. So uh, you guys are in the future. <laughs> But today we're going to be um, uh, working on translating the uh, spaghetti code I have for uh, super, uh, the Super Toast world. And um, uh, going to be altering it to uh, a finite state machine and, and going through all that. Hey, what's going on, Riley? So... Um, let's just switch over here and uh, let's get started today. Let me see here. Um, let me know if the stream gets choppy. I'm using some new software, so I'm hoping that it's going to be good. It is based on OBS, but you know how that goes. Sometimes that's uh, good, sometimes that's bad. So there may be some changes that you're not used to or the, in the audio. Just let me know and we'll get this uh, sorted out. All right, give me just a second here to get my water in place, and I'll switch over, and we'll get started. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Water in order, and uh, let's do this. So I'm going to push us over to the uh, main screen here, which is currently the... I'm going to close some stuff down, actually. Um, don't need this. I don't think I need this right now, either. Well, I'll leave it up just in case, and don't need this. Okay, cool. So here's the tile set that we're going to be working with. At least this is the current um, player animation tile set and animating tile set for to Super Toast World. That'll be available here, um, hopefully uh, near the end of the day, if not uh, during this week. Um, this is the first template that I'll be releasing for the multiple part um, asset pack that our lovely community has supported in, um, and uh, helped us on Ko-Fi to, to release to everyone, or Coffee rather. Uh, to release to everyone. So thank you guys so much for for helping me on that. Um, so we're going to be releasing the grasslands, which is this entire template set. So all of the terrain that's involved in that, including um, so it's actually two tiles or two set different sets of tiles uh, in a in a full template. Um, the uh, Mario like, hey, what's going on, Abu? Welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, and just getting um getting everything together here. So. Um, I'm going to end up exporting these um, and then naming them properly so that they can be available for GDevelop, um, which means I need to uh, do any fine tuning. So when you release assets on GDevelop, uh, which is the engine that I'm using for those that may be catching this later um, or just tuning in and, and have no idea what I'm talking about, um, GDevelop 5 is a uh, open source uh, game engine that's based around visual scripting and... Um, it makes it really easy to make games. Um, it uses uh, JavaScript and HTML5, but it is, it is practically a codeless drag and drop system. Um, and so to upload these files um, into the server um, or into the software for everybody to use, you have to format things and name them in a very specific way. So 
we're going to be going through and doing that boring step today and after um, I do some conversions. So let's start with um, kind of describing what the... I need to get out of Steam. <laughs> uh, let me close down my Steam. So that way we don't have any more interruptions there. Um, okay. So let's see here. Do we need, is there anything else here that we don't need right now? What is this? Microsoft Teams? Get out of here. I need that. I need the rest of this. Okay. So <laughs> um, what, what I'm going to do is show you the current project as it is and what my plan is with the asset pack and how we're going to include all of it today. Um, I, I imagine that we'll be doing quite a few of these videos where we um, start teaching game development from kind of the ground up, kind of using a, a template that I have and um, working through uh, processing what I've written um, and how you can take your code from this kind of messy script into um, a, a more polished state. And some of these videos are going to be multiple part. But I think for the live stream series, we're going to be sticking to these sort of titles that are more generic, that are just like how to make a game, because it's about catching the live stream in real time. And I'll leave some analytics and notes on each of the titles after I record them so people can know what we actually covered in them. Otherwise, um, expect the live streams to now be more about just getting into the game development process, the art process and all of that, where the, the video content on YouTube now will be more directed towards uh, answering direct questions and getting you guys the best tutorials I possibly can. So anyways, with that out of the way, thank you guys so much for stopping in. Uh, there's six of you already in here, which is fantastic. I love that. Um, thank you for your support so much. Um, let's, uh, let's begin here. So uh, currently as the, as the, um, the program sits currently, like I can open this and open the, um, whoops, open my settings tablet. So I have a little bit of um, extensions in this current script, no external scripts and one current mega script, which uh, the, a single event sheet, which handles all of our basic um, triggers and controls, which isn't too much, but I really want to take this basic template for um, using the stock settings and kind of elevate it to a more polished state. So let's preview what this game looks like. I'm going to turn on the sound because there is sound. Let me know if it's too loud. I'll try, try to turn it down. Oops. I want to keep that loop off. Don't want to blow your ears out. I'm going to kind of keep it low. It is r rather loud for me personally, but that's okay. So we kind of have this basic Mario style template where you can hit blocks and spawn cubes. There's uh, a holding down duck key. We're sliding and acceleration, deceleration based on sliding. We have. Oh. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> let me get. Oh no, I died. Oh well. You guys get the point. <laughs> you guys get the point. Uh, we'll, uh, we're going to be working on parallax backgrounds and all of that in this, in this video. So it's going to be. Oh my goodness! Well, I'm bad at my own video games, so that that's that's the mark of a, of a true developer, someone who uh, can't play their own their own game. Um, let's uh let's break this down and work towards. Uh, I'm gonna ex be explaining again. Uh, this is a really important concept to uh, to de new developers is finite state machines. It's a, it's a it is a um, mechanic. Uh, about, uh, let me, uh, I was reading chat and I have to look away from chat cause I want to answer Riley, but I have to first finish my thought <laughs> so that everybody who watches this can understand before I lose my train of thought. So, um, a finite state machine is a finite way, which is a restricted way, a very, um, a very limited way of controlling and operating game mechanics. And by developing in this way, uh, there are a number of ways that you can develop, but by doing a, a finite state machine, we can really help ourselves reduce the amount of clutter and um, code errors that we have. And when we do have an error, we can use the finite state machine with the debugging menu and find exactly where our errors are. 
if that makes sense. So, um, right. So, um, let's see. Riley, um, asked, uh, to go about making enemies. Uh, could I add multiple animations to a single object and come back and check animations and then add enemy logic? You could do that. Um, I think that that is a little messy, but we're going to even go into adding enemies today. And I'll show you when you can do that and when you shouldn't do that. Um, if you have an enemy, let's say we're going to talk about Mario for a moment, and then I'm going to relate my um, art here. So the intention here is with this Super Toast world, I'm going to be covering three different major platforming types uh, within the early... Um, within the 80s and 90s, so we're going to be targeting retro-style games like Super Mario and Kirby and Pikmin um, and, and even like Yoshi Story and games like this. And so I wanted to include a option in this game and in our development path to add all of those mechanics in a, in a super retro Metroidvania-style game. And in, let's say metroidvania light because this is really a platformer. But I thought that by incorporating a few of the old classic styles, like here we can see a maybe a Kirby uh, suck move where you inhale um, an enemy and then we have maybe a toast uh, flying in the air. We also have a new, we're going to add uh, some fun elements that are our own and we're going to add in kicking. So rather than picking up an enemy in this game, we're going to kick them. And when you kick them, they're going to go flying across the screen. Um, and hitting other enemies. Um, I created a the generic Mario style block while additionally adding in um, a special block that is kind of like the Yoshi egg block where we pop out um, egg guys because this is all breakfast themed and having little egg guys that follow you around that you can throw or kick to hurt other enemies like Pikmin um, mixed with some Yoshi story, right? And then um, some traditional Mario um, jumping and, and moving and climbing. And so now moving over to enemies and, and logic in how we build these enemies, um, in, uh, to, to be inspired by Mario a bit more, I wanted to go with some of the basic unit types, which are patrolling enemies and, um, and, and also uh, like jumping enemies and, and sliding enemies. And so... When we look at Mario, we have the basic we have the basic characters of the Goomba, which is the little mushroom guy that walks around on the ground, you know, kind of looks kind of goofy like that. And then we have the Koopa, which is the turtle. And then we have a couple different types of turtles, many different types of Koopas. Um, and in this case, we're going to be using apples in that sort of way. So in our game here, um, we can jump on an apple's head, and when it when we hit it, it goes into its shell, which in this game um, looks a little bit more like. Let me see if I can find the animation here. So we have our, uh, here's an Apple idle animation. He's not moving anywhere. He's just kind of chilling. And then we have his walking animation, right? And then we have, if you jump on his head, this happens. So he gets squished. Um, maybe it's kind of hard to see. Let me make it bigger, right? Um, let me go back so you can see his idle animation, right? And then we have his walk. We have his bounce. If you bounce on his head, this will happen. And then he'll go into a... Um, oh, oh. So you jump on his head, and then he goes into an idle that's in that mode for a couple of seconds. And then if you jump on his head again, he'll explode. And then if... Uh, there, like that. So this is the three-part animation. So we can see we have the initial idle, the jump on his head uh, alt uh, transition, and then the explosion. So if you jump on his head twice, this is what will happen. And, um, or we can kick him, and that's what this transition is. We can kick him, and he turns into a bullet, and he goes flying through the air, and whatever he hits. So I want you to imagine that if this is Mario, he's a turtle shell. So this is the red turtle shell. This is the uh, this is the basic one that you can kick and, and uh, smack around. And then we have our green apple, which is going to represent the... Um, the, the green turtle shell, which has uh, more capabilities, but in, in this particular case, although in, in like Super Mario World and other things like that, um, uh, there wasn't too much difference in the original color shell until later in the game when you could either eat them with Yoshi, which gave you different moves, like uh, the, the red shell gave Yoshi uh, the ability to blow fire, 
um, I think the green shell he spit back out and it became the sliding bouncing shell. And so rather than um, making it that complicated, what we're going to do is use the red guy to be the kickable and the one who goes flying and, and dies when he when he finishes, like hits a wall. Or uh, uh, we have the one that bounces off of walls and comes backwards and, and does some sliding. And so um, we don't have uh, a whole lot of uh animation here for that that spinning part but we'll add that later um but we have the 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 beginnings of our major units so we have a um it it is supposed to be a grape but uh i'm not sure that i sold that it looks kind of like a bomb um uh we'll figure that out later uh that's uh yeah interpretation um <laughs> uh but these are the guys, instead of like turtles that bounce, we're going to use these guys as um, uh, the bouncing Goombas, basically. So these are the most basic unit, and then we evolve into apples. And uh, even for now, if we wanted to, we could even make the egg guys bad guys uh, in the first episode and then work on transitioning them into allies that we can throw. Um, but we, we ha those are more advanced mechanics. So... Uh, in this release uh, for Super Toast World, the part one, you should be seeing um, if it's available on itch or when it's available on itch and gdevelop, you'll see that you'll have a full template for the bouncing berries, as well as uh, a complete animation set for the apples and the toast, as well as the environment. We'll be leaving out the, the chicken and the egg for the major release, but it'll be available in the playable demo. Um, I'm going to be... Uh, they're a long time inclusion object. Oh, I have heartburn. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. All right. So let's begin with the basic concepts of what I was talking about in GDevelop. So, although I have a template here and I will be um, using uh, quite a bit of this uh, as a recycled in my template, um, I won't be uh, directly copying it over. We're going to make sure we, we do this step by step together. So the first thing that we are going to do is, is I'm assuming that you have G develop and you're ready to roll. So um, if you are following this along in the future, um, there will be a download link to the itch uh, free assets that are available that you'll see in this in this demo um, and in this pack. Uh, and and for those that are watching now, um, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go to create a project and we're going to begin with our desktop landscape and we're going to use um, a a landscape that we don't have to zoom in on. So because this is 1280 by 720, there's an alternate path that we can take, uh, which is this zoomed in uh, four times, which is the smallest base resolution of the game. And we're gonna go to 310 by, or 320, sorry, 320 by 180. Now, some people might choose 240, that's an option. Uh, it gives it more of a classic look, but I like mine, uh, this, the the height a little bit shorter um but i think in, in in traditional like in mario it would be uh around in the super nintendo i want to say it's in the 240 resolution hmm i'm considering changing the resolution to fit the uh the original super nintendo um and i'm thinking that that would be fun what do you guys think should we go with a more modern um, window size for those that are in chat right now. What do you guys think? Modern window size or retro? Like, do we want to look like the Super Nintendo because we're making a Super Nintendo like game? Or do we want to retro always? Yeah, I mean, that. It really shouldn't have been a question, but I also uh, think that retro is is great. Um, we'll see if anybody else wants to stretch to full screen. Of course, yeah, yeah, retro. Well, okay, if you guys want it, we'll do it. So the retro size, so Super Nintendo. So it's interesting because the Nintendo 
the regular Nintendo was actually bigger resolution than the Super Nintendo, wildly. What happened was with the Nintendo upgrade into the Super Nintendo, we got a bigger color palette which allowed us to uh, have way more density of pixels and, uh, and different colors um, within that same screen space. And so with that evolution, we actually stretched the screen to be smaller so that way we could uh, to make that happen. So the actual resolution for the Super Nintendo is 256 uh, by 224. Exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah. And, and with the changes, we, uh, we were able to, to get rid of the sad, sad black bars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree. Uh, we, we either, well, in super, in super Mario, uh, you could, you could still, um, it would still go to full screen, but you could, you could stretch it. Um, it, or it did automatically stretch so that you didn't have the black bars but uh we're gonna be playing on an older style i wonder if we can get some i i think i want to take this the extra mile and i haven't done this before but i'm wondering if we can build um overlay like a crt overlay if it's not already in the engine let's work to i think that would be super fun to do let's make this as classic feeling as possible I think that would be super fun while not while improving the jankiness of of the old move mechanics of that era of game. Let's go retro looking, but cla but but modern feel. So let's take this to 224 and we'll see what we can do here. We'll see what we can do here. So we're going to change this. Um, um, what? Uh, Riley said something, and I'm not under. I'm not. Uh... Well, so we could, yeah. I mean, so technically, technically, I should, I should say, okay. The minimum of uh, the minimum scale of a game in in uh, the Super Nintendo is two fifty six by two twenty four. However, it can go up to five twelve by four forty eight, which means. It, the resolution has to be between those numbers. So we could make... Let me actually look at... What is Super Mario World's... Uh, uh, um, because we're going to base this off Super Mario World. And see... Okay, yeah. And so... so um, they used... Uh, 256 by 224. We're going to add authentication later. We're going to put this in the, uh, in, on my computer, um, because I'm going to export and, and uh, do this the right way um, so that you guys can, uh, we'll, we'll stick to the cloud first, actually. <laughs> Uh, we're going to call this a uh, super retro uh, template and we're going to begin. All right, you guys ready? So, oh, right. Uh, I can't do the cloud because I'm not signed in on this one. So we're just going to take this and I'm going to put it in my NVMe drive. Nope. In my storage, we're going to call this uh, um, templates. And inside of this template, we're going to call this super, super uh, retro template. All right, let's begin. So let's uh, select that folder and create our project. All right. Okay, I'm not used to this format, so I'm going to have to read the design some things, uh, but that'll be fun. I think it'll be good for you guys to see me do that transition. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's let's do this. Of course, in the beginning, uh, when we begin uh, our, our game, I think this time we're going to start with organization right away. And so uh, I'm not going to go through, I already have videos about ex explaining what all is going on here. So if you're new to this at any point and you're seeing this video, do check out my video. I have a whole boot camp series that I'm working on that'll be describing a lot of this. So I will explain a bit as I go, but I don't want to do it all right now. It'll slow down today's video. So 
I'm going to name this game scene. And this is just to reset my scene so that way I know this is my game scene. Now, I also know that I'm going to be having custom variables because we're going to do something called uh, custom key bindings. Now, if you want to add your own, if you want to get away from the default mechanics of the uh, built-in uh, uh, the built-in platformer templates or top-down, there's a button that says, um, and I'll show you guys here that in a minute, but there's a button that asks you if you want the default controls, and you can click that off. And if you do that, then you're, you have no player input to your character. And so we can use global variables and set up key bindings so that we can change it and let other people change it in the future. And that's really important for game uh, uh, accessibility and equability. So it, this, is, this allows more people to customize and play your game because they can change the controllers, say that they need to use a special game pad or something like this. It's really important. Everybody should consider this in their development. And if you don't, I'm sorry, shame on you. So, uh, but we can, we can do better, right? So we can recover from this. So this is how we recover. We're going to make custom key bindings. So we're going to call this, um, key bindings, right? And we're going to set this, key, the key bindings to uh, a structure, which allows us to add children. So now underneath key bindings, we're going to do keyboard. Okay. And underneath keyboard, and I'm going to do this even more detailed. We're going to do another structure because we're going to also add, um, one for controller um and we're gonna we're gonna do mobile but mobile does not require custom key bindings um i don't i personally um i would suggest that if you're using a mobile device and playing games um you always offer um the button mapping on the screen and you have all of that preset but if you can allow customizing design, um, I will go through how to do that in another video. And I don't think I'll be allowing those uh, those changes right now because it's a pretty standard game. It's a D-pad with a couple jump keys and a couple other buttons. So we don't need to worry about that. So in uh, both of these are structures and we can do like controller jump key and, and everything. So we're going to add a new one and we're going to add keyboard and it's up, right? And this string is going to be W. It needs to be lowercase. If you are using a controller and it has a key, it would be a capital letter. And every time we want a, a left control, uh, something on the left side or the right side, it always starts with a capital and then it's uh, left like that as well. So left uh, arrow key would be with a capital um, and, and then also... Um, <clears throat> controller keys, A, A, B, Y, X, those sort of things are like this. So up can be just lowercase w for the keyboard. And then we're just going to add more variables. Um, and we're going to add uh, the direction. So we're going to add uh, right. We're gonna, or, yeah. And then we're going to add left and down. I'm going to organize this. I like to organize mine in... Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I forget that it, it's alphabetical in the uh, key bindings, or I believe... Um, and then, so down will be, uh, S and actually now that I'm thinking about it, this is a platformer and I think that WASD would be very uncomfortable, even though most people are, uh, right. Uh, they're right handed. Um, when using a platformer game, I think that using the arrow keys with the right hand makes sense. Um, but we allow rebinding so people could use WASD, but I think that doing it all on one hand gets messy and hard for newer players to, to get comfortable with the keyboard. So we're actually going to do um, the arrow keys, which is also, um, oops, <laughs> up up for down. No, no, down for down. Uh, yeah, normally you could do WASD here, but we're gonna do, do it like this. And we're gonna do uh, a jump key. So we're gonna add one more and do uh, jump. And jump is now going to be the space key, which is done like this, okay. So we have our basic elements. We have move, jump, um, down. That's all we need right now for, for this sort of game. Um, we're gonna hit okay. And now we have those. So now that we have that in place, um, I'm just setting up some preliminary things that I know that I'm gonna need right away. Let's see here. Extensions, these are important. I'm gonna add a couple extensions that I know that we're gonna be using and, um, and I'll explain what they are as we get to it. So 
in the in the extensions the first thing that i would like to add is the advanced jump um advanced jump uh platformer movements allows us to add in uh some air jumps some dashes and something called coyote time which is also known as ledge tolerance this is something that wasn't in classic games it was very uh it you know it didn't come until later um and this added in some some game feel that made it so that way you didn't just fall immediately off the ledge. Maybe there's a little bit of accessibility added in that, in those features as well. So we have that. Um, that's really important. Um, we're going to have a uh, pixel perfect movement. Um, no, actually, we don't need that one. I, I, I lied. Uh, we need parallax. Parallax for a tiled sprite. This is great to add. This is, I mean, everybody, you need this. This is awesome. So we're going to install this. This is how to very easily do parallaxing in your game. We're also going to add the game pads extension. So game pads. We can get rid of parallax on that search list. Add that. And now we can search uh, room-based movement. So room-based camera movement. This is kind of fun. It lets us do some pretty cool transitions if we wanted to in a more modern sort of way. Um, like Mega Man or... Uh, in metroidvanias where we can kind of scale and move the camera around very cool add that in and then we're also going to add my favorite and i think the thing that adds that beautiful retro polish for uh specifically more for the mario game which is the the 3d flip with uh with animation um flipping your character with that paper like mario flip so now that we have these are for now all of the extensions that we're going to use and now we're going to transition into um, the making of the game. So, of course, um, the, the first thing that I like to do is start developing our, our event sheet. And um, I'm going to do some event groups here. Uh, just right click and create an event group. We're going to copy this a few times just so I have them. And we're going to work on a few basic machines that we need for our game. So what you're able to do when you first get started you may you may wonder okay a lot of people wonder this and it's totally normal where from this canvas from this canvas where do we begin our game journey there are so many places to start how do we start well that's what i'm here for and this is my favorite thing to teach i believe that we can we can begin our ga game development journey by um actually this is a perfect time to, to show you my technique so the way I break this stuff down, okay, is I'm going to go ahead and make a new one of these. And actually, let's do, uh, we know it's 256 by uh, 224, right? 220, 224, 224. So we're going to use a clipboard that we, we are going to make a, a, a template for what our game screen is going to look like. So this is what I do. I create this in my art program. So you create a canvas to the size of the screen that you're going to be working with gives you a, an idea of what the final project might look like. So if you're thinking about drawing a game, I normally start with a blank canvas to the screen size, and I want to make a, a complete scene that is that looks like the game that I want. Now, some of you might not be artists, and, you, and you're still wondering, well, how do I do this if I'm not an artist? Well, let me show you this. So we are going to create a game scene, but now I'm not going to draw this. Instead, we're going to take from a project that we already know and love in the retro genre, and that's Super Mario World. Um, and so I'm going to go to Super Mario World and get a picture of it real quick and show you something. So um, let me see if I can get a good action shot of Super Mario World and some of things happening in, in that. And how do, we, how do we break this down? So this is a good, a good screenshot. Let me see if I can just grab this and pull it in. Credits to uh, Nintendo here. Don't sue me. Um, <laughs> please, please don't sue me. Okay, so um, here we go. So here, here we begin. Let's say that we drew this. Wow, look at this. This is an amazing game. No one's ever seen this before. Uh, this is a complete scene of something that might be happening in our game. Well done. Uh, you guys, this, is, this looks so impressive. <laughs> um, so what we do is when I begin here, all jokes aside, I'm making jokes, okay? All jokes aside, this is how we do this. So what I like to do 
is look at what's happening in the scene. And because I'm a visual person, I like to block this out. So no matter who you are, right? No, doesn't matter what your art skill level is. Start with what we know we can already do. So in, if you have never used game develop, I've never done game development at all, um, you might not have anything that you can block out. And that's totally okay. But let's start with what you know how to do. So we, I know, I, we can make time, time counters, we can make score systems, and those are very basic mechanics in GDevelop. Now, I do cover this in some of my courses, but also GDevelop has an introduction page when you first get started that will, in fact, if you just go to your homepage um, and go to uh, getting started, there's everything that you could want to know. Everything on Mario is right here. Do this, and, and I mean, you could skip the 3D box. But do this, and you have the controls for Mario on your phone right now, right out of the gate. So if you haven't done this and you want to make a platformer, you need to start here. Honestly, it's available to you. You should be doing this. It's very easy to follow. So now we, if you completed this, we can block this out. So what we're going to do is I'm going to create a new layer above the one that we currently have. And now I'm going to block this out because you did the tutorial. You know how to do this. You can do this. So uh, we're going to start with the edges that we do know, and we can do this. Okay. So now I know that I can start here if I wanted to, because these are systems that I already know how to build, but they're good basic systems. And as you build them, you can start blocking them out. Oh, okay. Well, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And this is a good way to start breaking down where to begin. It's very simple because before you can do this, you need to be able to walk and move and do other things. But this tells your brain that you need to do this. You need enemies that walk around. You need an enemy that pops out. And these are all mechanics that we can start building. Now, it doesn't tell you how to start them, but it tells you where to start your journey. So the more you know about the beginning of your project, like a game development document or something you drew as a concept, we can start extrapolating what you wrote or what you see into a game functioning mechanic. So this is a way that I work with myself to do all this. So we're going to begin in uh, with our system with the Super Toast world. And so we're going to transition um, back into my template here. And because of the work I've done, I've been able to draw some scenes and things. So parallaxing and, and the game's edge and other features that were in that game. Um, as well as tile set information that's kind of overlapping here, but you get the idea, right? So now that I have these basic features as an artist, I can kind of jump straight into the development process. And in the future, you can get these well organized in a nice little folder in a download. So, you know, you don't have to stress about not having assets or anything like that. Um, so, okay. So with that, and now that I, I, I've kind of broken down where to begin, I want to start with like the most important feature, which is our player movement, right? And the terrain. So I'm going to start knowing that I've already done this part of my game, and now we're going to add it into uh, GDevelop. So we're going to create our objects at the very beginning. And GDevelop makes this very easy. So before anything else, any of the logic for anything, I want to start on on adding in the basic object. So if I go into GDevelop, right, just kind of move this stuff around. Uh, this is the standard sort of layout for GDevelop. Um, I go to, you know, you go to create an object and we're going to start with a sprite. Now we don't have the sprite image yet, so we're just going to call this toast. And now I need to import those objects. So this is where you can go into the file that you'll have and import them, but I have to export them first. So let me do that now. Um, we're going to start with the anim the idle animation, because that's the easiest to begin with. And then we'll also, at the same time, add the, the player movement. Um, and then we'll just do, we'll export piece by piece as we need it. So we'll start at the very beginning um, and do the player idle. So we'll file, export. Uh, this is an animation. This is the idle animation, so I can select idle. Idle, and we're gonna remove this around. 
let's see here. I got to assign it to the right spot. So we're going to go templates, retro template. Um, actually, um, that will put it inside of our game file. We don't need to do that yet. I'm going to have the engine automatically pull it in. So it's as authentic to you as it should be. So we're going to call this uh, super, um, super toast. And inside of super toast, we're going to add a sprites folder. And inside of sprites, we're going to start organizing sprites. And we're going to start with the uh, toast sprite. And inside of toast, we can now save it here. And do it'll be toast underscore idle, because that's just how it exports. And then it'll be 0, 1, 2, and 3, because there's four animation frames. So I'm just going to export this. We don't need to increase the size. We want this as default as possible. Export that. And of course, because I wasn't paying attention, um, I added the purple background to my export that you could see it here. I just turn that off and then we're going to overwrite without asking and do it again. <laughs> and, and yeah, and we'll be good. There we go. So going into our GDevelop project, of course, we can add our toast character, import our image, and you're going to need to select the, um, the folder. Go into your sprites, toast, and select idle zero. And actually, um, cancel. Oh, that's fine. Well, I'm going to delete that. Um, we, I just want to select all. Uh, I can select all of them in this in, in this part. Okay, my phone is blowing up. I'm going to move this off of my desk so that you guys uh, don't have to hear the buzzing. And, uh, oh, that's a text. Let me get back to that. For, I'll be right back. Let me just text this back. And uh, one second. I'm back. Okay, so now we're going to name this idle. So you should have in in this so far, um, uh, a the the four, the four animations that we need. So zero, one, two, and three. And if we we run a loop, this animation, and we're going to preview it. So this is going pretty fast because it's twelve frames every uh, every loop cycle. So 12 frames a second, which is a lot of frames for a little object. So we're going to look at it and I'm going to slow this down. So I like to, I'm, for this one, I'm going to do 0 0.1 and that gives us a, a 10 frames. We could go a little bit slower if we wanted to. We could play around and, and see what feels good. That's a pretty smooth animation, even down. And in, in, I see when we get down to six, it's a little slow. Eight is okay. But I think that for the, the style of character I want, I want to really bouncy, right? Really, we're going to go modern a little bit here, and we're going to give this character just some, some creative bounce. And then uh, we're going to add another animation and call this walk. And then you'll do the same thing for the walk animation uh, that, that we just did for the idle, of course. And we're going to go to animations, idle, and go to walk now. And now it'll be toast walk. Perfect. Save that. Uh, just in case and then add the sprites and now we have walk okay and i'm going to be obnoxious uh and uh for myself and for you as well i'm sorry guys but i think that the best way for me to organize all of this and make it as user friendly as possible is by over um organizing but i think that by over organizing it does make it a perfect organization so sorry but here we go um, I don't need it like this. Can we go back to the list? Perfect. So now uh, I can open the walk animation and import it to our project. So uh, now we have the idle and walk animation. Cool. And now if we added this, our character to the screen and we ran the game, it would just idle, right? That's all we did. We added an animation. That's pretty cool, I guess. You know, it did, it did the thing. Did the thing. It's doing the thing. So now what we want to do is we're going to go into the object, go to the behavior, and we're going to add the very first mechanic, which is the, the platforming character. It, I, this gets me every time. So when, when you guys open this up, be gentle, be slow. Platform is for the things you stand on. Platformer character is the controller for the character. If you look at platform, you might get excited and just click on it, but you need platform character. Okay? 
And now I'm going to set the controls to what I like for this particular um, character. Now, I also want to add another behavior because we added something earlier from our... Um, uh, something stuck to my mouse. Um, we added the advanced uh, jump mechanics. So we could just add advanced uh, or jump. Maybe it's jump. Jump. There it is. We want to add the... Um, Coyote time, air time, and I'm going to set the number of air jumps to zero. I don't want him to be able to jump again in the air. And we're going to say that floor jumps count as air jumps when we, when, if, you know, if we decide to use this. And we're going to do a coyote time of one, two, five. So this is uh, like, sec uh, like seconds, right? So this is a very small amount of time, but you'll be surprised you know you could do uh, a quarter uh, of a second if you wanted to which is 0.25 um but in my opinion it, it 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 gives you too much time it makes it way too easy so um we're gonna do that and then we couldn't we could initialize oops we could initialize a platformer stack to keep all of our stuff um organized which is this the just inside if you type jump it's the platformer character configuration stack um, and this is kind of important because it, it allows us to, um, set all of our settings to the same object. So now it, they're configured to this, they're using the base configuration and we can address the configuration stack rather than the object stack later. That's kind of complicated, but it just keeps it a little bit more organized if we're using code and variables in code to select this platform and character. So we're going to turn off default controls. And for this character, um, I have some preset settings that I that I know work, um, at least for what I want. And um, we'll see if that continues to function <laughs> for the coming uh, development. So now we have 200, 200. Uh, so acceleration is 200, deceleration is 200, and the max speed is 150. And the slope speed is a 60 degree angle. And I want to leave that currently as is. Um, I think that'll be good enough. Oh, and we want to add one more behavior to the character. I know this is a lot that we're adding, but we did prep for this. Now we want to write 3D and add the 3D behavior. So now, if you're following along, this is the exact settings. So you can pause and look at them as you need to. So we'll go up to the top. Zero. Here. Floor jumps count as air jumps. 0 0.125 we'll leave gravity as it is and we change uh, our fall speed to 500 pixels we do it at 350 and then at a jump of 0 0.25 that's how long we can sustain our jump hey funk and then we have our ladder climbing speed at 150 our grab tolerance doesn't matter because we don't use these features here um, and our acceleration again is 200, deceleration 200, and then max speed 150, and slope 60. Hey, thanks, I appreciate it. And then we added the 3D flip. So that's, that's all the settings, as well as adding the configure stack, and we've done everything we need to do with the player. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, that's what I'm doing, Abu, and I'm, 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 I'm teaching the finite state machine mechanics and other things in this video again. So now, if I press preview, this character is going to fall out of the screen, right? You might be if you if your computer's slow, he might fall out of the screen before you even load. Where's your character, right? What's going on? Why did this happen? Well, this happened because we don't have a platform, <coughs> a platform for our character to stand on. So, what we're going to do is add add the platform mechanic. Now, I want to show you the easiest way to do this. Um, it, no matter what your game looks like, so let's say you import a picture as your, you could import a single picture, um, as a sprite and then as your level, if you wanted to. So your whole level is complete. So you use an art program. You could use a collision box of your own making, um, to, to make the shapes that you want. Now we're not going to do that in the long run, but I want to show you how to get started in making your game first and then navigate to the right way or, or, or the long term. Uh, plan. So we're going to use a tiled sprite. And the reason we use tiled sprites, uh, I'll explain in a second. Um, but we're going to change this to a 16 by 16 grid because that's the size of our game. We're going to call this collision. 
uh, collision box. Okay. And then now that we have collision box, we're going to create it with Piscal. We, you could use another art program if you want, but it's super simple to do in here. We want to make sure that we resize our item to 16 by 16 and resize our canvas. Um, and I use a rectangle tool and just add a red, a red cube. Now that we have a red cube, I like to use the pin stroke tool, which is this one L if you want to hold shift and draw a, di a perfect diagonal from each corner to make a little, a little X in the box. And we're going to call this uh, new and we're going to call this uh, collision. Uh, collision cube is the texture name. And now that we have the collision cube in the collision box, we can hit OK and drag it into our game scene. So now there's no real snapping going on here. We could hold shift if we wanted to, um, but there's no grid snapping. So we need to set our grid by going up here to the little hashtag, add our grid. And we're going to set it up at 16 by 16 just to, to fit inside of the scale here. And then we're going to turn it on, show grid. So now we have our, our game settings. And because we use a, a, a tiled, a tile uh, sprite, I can now continuously recreate this with one object that is just a length. And every 16 by 16, it'll just repeat the cube. Now, if we press play, the character's still going to fall out of the game because there's no configuration. So we have to go into the behavior. And now this is where, if you don't type anything in, you don't even need to. It's the first one on the list, platform. Platform is what you want. Now you can change a platform to be different types of platforms, ladders, jump through platforms, just a regular platform is fine. Turn off ledge grabbing because we don't ledge grab in this game, but you might want to in a, in a metroidvania or something like that, but not in this style. We don't need that. So we're gonna hit apply. And now when we hit preview, we're gonna touch the screen. And none of my keys work because I've disabled those default controls that we talked about. Um, and now we wanna start adding in the control of our character. So if we zoom in, we can kind of see what's going on here. Now, we are making a retro game, a retro game, and this is the resolution of our game. Now, when we do this, it stretches. We don't want that to happen because we're developing a retro game that doesn't scale like that. So what we want to do is go to our project manager, go to our properties, and scroll down to where it, right here underneath the resolution and rendering, it says change the width to fit the screen and the window size. We're going to say no changes, and then we're going to hit apply. Okay. And now when we scale our game, we get the black, the black edges, of course, and here it is. Now, some people are like, well, okay, this is retro. This is cool, but I don't want the, um, the, the, this resolution. You could simply change this by changing it to the resolution we had discussed before. So if you want a full screen and uh, not a, a, uh, a, this is, this is the, um, four by three perspective. If you want the 16 by nine perspective, right? You can simply just go into your, uh, your, your settings, change this to 320 by 180 and hit apply. And now if we move our cube and we run our game, it is now mo you know, mostly there. We're almost there. So we can continue to do this to two, uh, the true resolution would be 240. Hey, large volts. Um, I don't know how to say, uh, your name, uh, I'm, uh, I don't even know what to call you. I almost said Sphil, but, uh, I, yeah, I have no idea. What is the stream about? The stream is about how to make games and we're converting, um, a, a template that I'm working on into, um, a full project for you guys to learn on. So, um, <clears throat> anyways, we can adjust the, the black edges by adding a little bit more um, on the width. So I think actually I told you the wrong resolution. Uh, I think it's 240 is, um, 320 by 240, I believe is the full resolution. No, no, that puts us back in, in four by three. Uh, did I have that right. Is it 260? I don't remember. Uh, I'll let you research that. I, My mind right now is on a different task. Um, 240, right? 256 by 240 is Mario. I got distracted. 
256 by 240. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, 224. 224, not 240. 224. I almost made that mistake. I almost did the, the regular Nintendo. There we go. There we go. So now we have um, the, the beginning. Uh, the beginning all set up so now uh we are going to start adding in the player movement mechanics and then we're going to replace all the textures in the game so i'm going to start by early organization this is super important that you start your game early okay and by by doing it early you're going to be able to save yourself so much time here so um <clears throat> Let me go back to the, so we're going to start in our, our, our programming, um, the programming area, the visual side. So all I've done for those that were just, uh, just joining us, you right click and you create an event group. Now I'm just duplicating this because I know that we're going to have multiple event groups and we're going to begin our game with an, an uh, initialize state. So this is kind of where we, uh, you could say beginning of the scene, right? But I'm, I'm going to say in it, in it for initialize. So um, configure uh, setup. So config setup. And we're going to make another one for camera, uh, camera manager. And, uh, or actually, we're going to say camera controllers. Controllers. Um, and camera. There we go. And let's see. Uh, let me make sure. Okay. And we're going to do the, uh, let's see, we can go game mechanics is one of them. So game mechanics, and this will house some sub subcategories like uh, level end scripts. Um, we're going to want, uh, 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 let's see, cube, uh, coin. We're going to say collision with blocks. Uh, collision with blocks. Uh, coins is another one. Uh, so collections, I think, is probably better. Uh, collections, level end, collision with blocks. Okay, so collision with blocks, we're going to do this in a specific order. Uh, those are game mechanics that are like outside of the player. We're going to do a player uh, finite state machine. Okay. And now we're going to get into the concepts of what a finite state machine is and how we build it in GDevelop. Now, every time you could create your own extension, and these are hard to do, and I'll be covering this in, they're kind of hard to do, but uh, they're a, a great advanced skill in GDevelop. You could make an extension to manage what we're about to do here and give yourself uh, a, a bit more organization, but this really is very straightforward and very easy. So we're gonna, we're gonna transition to the player manager is what we're gonna call it for now. Uh, we're gonna call it the player state manager, and we're going to create um, a, a, the first external script of our game. So for those that don't know how this works, when you create a scene in your game, which is a game scene, it creates two features, a layout, which is this, and a event script, which is this. So now when we go to our project, we look at external, external events and external layouts. What this means is they're standalone versions of either of these. So this is a layout. This is an event script, right? So now we go into our event scripts. We want an external event, which means we want another blank coding screen that we can manipulate and, and program in. So what we're going to do is go into our external layout and we're going to add one and we're going to call this player finite state machine or FSM. And this is the, the manager, the beginning part of this script sequence. We're going to add a lot more external events, but this is how we start player finite state machine. And this is a fancy way of saying our player controller, um, but we're going to be using a technique called finite state machines or state machines. 
And this technique of programming uh, is what I kind of described at the beginning, which is a refined way of, of development um, that reduces clutter and also um, gives you a, a better understanding of where errors are happening in your programming. This is a good, good programming technique to learn. So when we enter at the very beginning of our program, we need to create under the player state manager a blank event, and then we're going to right click it, add, and we're going to add a link external event. So when the game starts, whenever we press the, the play button, initialize, of course, our objects, but also run our script. And now that we've added include an event from an external layout or an external event, we're going to click on it. And because we've developed it here, we can now see it in the drop down list. We hit OK and we've added it. So whenever our game runs, it's going to include you may have seen this in this word in other programming languages, specifically in like JavaScript and and, and um, uh, sorry, in, in, in um, uh, uh, C, uh, in the C language, um, you'll see, uh, you know, hashtag include as a, as a feature uh, to add libraries. So we're saying we're importing, import this script, hit OK. And it's going to ask you, even though we've added it, to edit the external event, choose a scene in which it'll be included. So now this is important, and I want to take a moment to explain this, because when you go to the game scene, and you see how we have scene objects here, if we created a global object, it would be available in every layout, no matter what. However, they're scene objects. Now, if we don't link them together, so if I selected something else other than the game scene, but we only have one currently, say the main menu, it, this will import all of the local scene objects and it'll share them between the both of them always. It's not just will it import them, but it'll keep them connected indefinitely. So now we hit choose. And now we, everything we add, um, if this was a layout, anything we added here, we can access here. So anything in the scene, scene timers, scene variables, um, anything that you would normally pass into your event script here, we can now access on this one. So in the player finite state machine, we do kind of the same thing. I always begin with an external event and I like to add a group and add, we're going to add a couple of these. So now I want you to name an event group idle. I want you to name one uh, walk or run. And then we're going to have another one called jump. Okay. <clears throat> we also are going to, because we jump, we need a false state. And let's see, idle, walk, jump, fall, and any other state we might want our character to do. So now we're planning what our character is going to be able to do in animation, in, in everything. So what I first like to do is do an, an, uh, a player um, debugger, which is the first element of our, our game. Um, which will tell us when we create our character if there's any errors. So we, we can add a buffer here before we even start our game to make sure our player is initializing. And we'll add that script in a minute. But now we, I want you to just duplicate this and add the same thing to each one of these. Okay, just leave them blank for now. But we're going to create an event script. So you see how this is starting to become organized. So from the beginning, we have our, our different managers and different things that are happening in our game. We can click on their scripts, go to their individual customized scripts. So when we have a idle, rather than managing it in one gigantic statement, you know, one, one event here, we can organize it and reduce um, key over, overlapping. So sometimes if you're developing a game in GDevelop or anything else, you may encounter uh, like uh, program that says, well, when the player's on the floor, so I can kind of show you this here. So a bad way uh, or the basic way of starting programming without this as, a, as an option is people go into here, they go to their toast character and they say, can jump or is falling or is jumping is on the floor. Now we're still going to be using this logic, but if you did it in one giant script, it becomes very difficult to separate when you're on the floor and dashing when you're on the floor and and moving and and very quickly you run out of options to how to make your character do more than the basic stuff so 
<clears throat> what we what we do instead is we separate all of that and make it into a organized little document called a finite state machine and it, it reduces that uh what you can do in each state and i'll explain that in a minute so now again we we have all that set up nothing's happening but now we can begin on our character development so now we have a player's finite state machine the first thing that we do is idle so we're going to go into here add a new external layout so we're going to do player and we're going to do uh, fin uh, finite state machine idle, right? Or you can do player idle finite state machine. But I like to keep it with the same conventions of player finite state machine idle state. We're going to do player finite state machine uh, lock. We're going to... Um, I'm going to rename lock actually to um move and we're gonna fix that in our uh real quick in here we're gonna say move that way we don't forget now we're gonna go back in here and so we have idle move we're gonna make fly uh, player finite state machine fall um as well as jump uh player finite state machine uh jump we're gonna organize these you can just click on the little the little lines and organize them any way you want so you can it doesn't matter their organization here. It's, this isn't how their scripts are deployed, but this allows us to access um, our different events. So now that we have them, we can add them here. So we're going to click on idle and say idle script. Move is the move script. Jump is the jump script. And fall is the fall script. Pretty straightforward. But we have no way of knowing currently what state our player is in. So to do this, we go to our game scene, go to our toast, add a new variable that we're going to call uh, state. So the toast dot state. And then we're going to keep it as a string and we're going to start it with the I N I T or the initialize state. Okay. So that means is when our player now it's we can see if we click on our player and we go over here to our objects instances panel, we see state initialize I N I T. Right. So when we start the game, we know he's going to start in the state. Now, remember when I said we added that debugger text? Now we're going to add our player and finite state machine. I call this actually the init file, the initialization. And if you really wanted to put this in order, you could say player finite state machine, then the initialize. So we're going to add initializer. And all this is going to do, we're going to open it up, set our game scene. We're going to add an event. And it has one job, okay? At the beginning of the scene, we want we want to make sure that our player is transitioning. So at the beginning of the game scene, if uh, our player is in the initialized state, so if our toast is in the, we can go variable, we're going to check its variable. If the variable state is equal to n-i-n-i-t, right? Um, this is a number, my bad. Text, make sure you do text, not a number. State is equal to i-n-i-t. Then we're going to, uh, and I think I might have, oh, i-n-i-t. We got to do it in quotes. Uh, then what we're going to do is change the player state. So player, we're going to change the text. And we're going to change that text of state equal to, in quotes, idle with a capital. You have to make sure that every time you set it, you set it to whatever you named it um, or whatever you're going to name it in your finite state machine. I, start with a capital. It makes sense. So here we go. So now at the beginning of the game scene, we can even remove the beginning of the game scene. Whenever this happens, if the player state or the, the toast state is in the initialized state, set it to idle. So if we hit preview, our player should be in the idle state. How do we check? Well, we go up to here, update. Even if your game is currently running, you can go to update, start, preview, and debugger. It's already previewing. Continue anyways. Um, I do have a subscription, but because I'm not logged in, I'm using the desktop offline version. It's not logged in, so that's okay. We select the game here. If it doesn't automatically do it in the debugger, we click refresh. We can click on our instances, toast, so scenes, game scenes, scene variables, instances, toast. Click on toast, and we can see here the instance variable 
the state string is now idle. Now, if this was initialize, we would know that our character is broken and there's some code issue in the initialization step because to even be in this step, we would, you, you can set a, a, a parental thing. You could, you could actually put this out here. So copy this and we are going to make a new text state and do this. So now this is the foundation of our entire script. So the game engine, I want you to think about this. If we press preview, it's going to load these events. It only has logic right now for the player finite state machine. It launches this because there's no condition. It launches it immediately. And then it launches into this because the player starts in the initialization state. And that means this has to be true for us to be in this place, right? So if we're going to be in the initialization state, this has to be true. Now run this. As soon as this happens, run this code. Well, we can just delete this now. And this is the same saying the same thing, but it's just run in the script. Maybe there's some other initialization stuff we want to add later, but right now we don't need to. So maybe we add configuration controlling the player's speed or setting it to some sort of default. You could add that here, but right now we don't need to. So now that we have this template, I want you to copy the initialize state and go into each of these and paste in, this is idle, right? With a capital, because we're transitioning into this state. And now when we reach this state, only read the code that's in here. So this is how we control player movement in a really really restricted way that prevents errors from happening because it requires this condition to be true before we enter into the next. So this kind of works like the is on floor. However, if the play, the toast is on floor and is in the idle state, we can do something. And then if we're in a different state and, you know, and on the floor, we can do something else and we can reorganize it by just controlling this one element. Okay. So now we're going to go into our idle. And very and, and this is the the very basic idea so when we're in idle um what i like to do is start each of these templates with an event group and in these event group we generally need two things we need um uh, i say generally what i put here is uh called actions but actions are defined as what can i do in this state so what can i do in the state and then transitions, transitions are what are how do I leave this state, right? So how do I leave this state? So these are the, this is the code that you're going to add. So if you click on these and hit shift D, it'll add a child. So we have a child element in each of these, and these are the actions. So if, what can we do in this state? Well, I want to begin by saying if we're in the idle state, which we already know is true, and the toast's animation for some reason, the toast animation by name, and we're going to select idle. If, and we're going to invert this, we're going to say if the, the toast animation is not set to idle, when we enter the idle state, please set the um, character's animation to idle. This guarantees that every time that this is true, every time the player finite state machine becomes true and we go into the idle state, make sure that the player's animation is set. Now, now in idle, we can't do Jack. This is, and I want you to think about this. Actions are what we can do in this state. Well, we, if we touch any key, we need to leave the idle group, right? We need to leave idling. So we need to make a movement script, but we don't want to put the movement script into the idle. So we need to say if the movement keys are pressed, any of them, then transition into a movement state. So if left or right are pressed, because in this case, up isn't really a button. Um, we could assign up to also be jump because that would be true in like a traditional way uh, in some games, but we want jump to be a, an up, uh, a jump key. So up in our game, the up key is going to be used for climbing climbing up vines and things like that. So that's an interaction key. So we need to think about what we can do first. So we're going to create a new event group. 
And like I said, we are going to uh, go to move state. So uh, move state. So now we add the move state logic. So in the move state, if, and this is where we're gonna use those, those custom key bindings. And this is the beginning of how we, we customize our, our controller and make it so that anytime they change a key binding, it automatically translates to all of your scripts. So we're gonna say, we're gonna start with an or statement, or. So or, if any of these are true, if one of these conditions is true, we're gonna move to the move state. Well, we already know we're gonna move to the move state, so we can say toast, variable and we're, again it's a text we're using a text a single text variable called state control everything so this one is going to be called um uh move because we're going to go to the move state right so we know that whatever this condition is we need to transition here and we can do this because player finite state machine is running all the time and it's looking for the text change so when we change the text here we know that we it automatically applies to the parent above it we're saying globally that this is, or for the, for the instance of this toast, that this is true. So now we need to say the condition. So if the key, and we're gonna look for key pressed text expression. So if the key button is pressed, and the expression that we're going to be using is, because it's a global variable, we're gonna do, uh, we type global, and we're gonna do variable, because it's a global variable, and, um, why is this translating to string? Key press text expression. No, this is true. Uh, if global variable um, key bindings dot keyboard, and we're gonna pass through the left key f uh, first. So this doesn't need to string because it's already we're already using a string, I believe. No, it test expression global variable to string. I wonder if they changed something in the most recent uh let me just double validate something maybe i'm betraying my own mind here but i thought that um Oh, duh, duh, duh. Sorry, guys. So you don't have to pass into string. Uh, that's, uh, geez, I had to look at the documentation. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, all right, we're good. Let me go back to what I was doing. Uh, All right. So, okay. Um, what we're going to do is instead of saying to string, you can do that, but instead we're going to say global variable string because we don't need to, we can define that it is a string here. We're passing in a string. And the string is, we don't need it in quotes because it's it's verified as a string. And by, because of this sentence, it already, and, and we declared it as a string. So we know that key bindings, keyboard left is the um, left arrow key. And we're gonna say if, if, le if either of these are true and we're just gonna duplicate it and then change left to right. So if the left or right key is pressed, go to the move state. That's it. As soon as that happens, it's gonna to move to move state and it's gonna run the move state code. And if we did trigger once, as soon as this happens, it, we would trigger that one time, but we wanna make sure that anytime we're in the idle and no matter what weird key, whatever happens, I don't think we need to, I may be wrong here. <laughs> I may eat my words, but I don't think so. So uh, we're going to go into our move script, right? We started this, but now we need to set the text. So I'm just gonna duplicate this and say, uh, we're going to rechange this from idle to move just so I have a template that I could copy and paste. And then we're going to change idle to move. All right. Now we're in the move script. And just like the idle, I'm going to take these two features very easily. I'm going to copy them. And now that we're in the move script, set it to the game scene. And we're just going to paste these in. Okay. 
and we can now organize it. So what actions can we do here? Well, we, we're, we're not going to idle. So if, if we are uh, not in the walking animation, we're going to set this to walk. And I know that it's called move, but the animation is called walk, and that's okay because this is the movement script, not the run, and we're going to use all of our movement mappings and key controls in this area, okay? So the animation, if it isn't walk, set it to walk. All right. And that can actually kind of go out. It's not really an action, um, but we want actions of what we can do in this state. And now we add the player movement script. So now we're going to go into here and type player movement. But we don't need, we're not going to add a, a new event group. That'd be too messy. Um, and that would overextend our finite state machine. So we're going to start handling our movement here. And we're going to go back to our idle script, take that transitional key map, which is left is pressed or right is pressed. And we're going to take it over here and put it in here. So when the left key is pressed, and we could do an or, and this is a great time to introduce controllers. And there's a way to add controllers that um, I do want, uh, this is an important feature that I should have mentioned before. If you add a controller to your game and you have a USB headset, there's some programming that you need to change around because your computer may read your headset as a gamepad because it's checking for USB devices. It's not very, it's not refined, this, this app extension. There are some gaps and things that could happen. So if you follow this directly along, and you have a USB headset plugged into a primary port, it very well might not work the way that I'm doing it. So all you'll need to do is change the controller number or unplug that headset and plug your controller in first and then your headset. But sometimes it takes priority. So here in a second, so what we're gonna do here is right click and do or as well to add that controller support. So now whether we're in a controller or a, um, a keyboard binding. So we don't have any keyboard buttons mapped yet to our global variables. And that's okay because in a we're going to use the um, behavior that we, the extension that we added to the game instead for now, uh, at least for this key. So now we're going to do a subcondition and type controller. Okay. And now we are going to be looking for controller input. So we could do a gamepad type and, and there's other coding we can do to verify that it is a controller and like checking if the gamepad is connected um, and or do a button put press at the beginning of the game to verify, okay, that import, you know, that button is, or that controller is the controller that we're assigning. Um, but I'll do that. Uh, I'll do the um, setup for that in a later video um, as we refine the code for release and that's okay so any but so now what we're looking for though is a button press so now we have the stick pushed access and we have a button press and i want to show you the, the kind of the difference right so button presses are the d-pad um and uh, basically all of the keys where stick accesses are the left stick um wouldn't be A, it would be left or right stick. The game, this is what I was saying, the gamepad identifier may need to be number two if you have a USB headset in. So we're gonna say one, I don't even have one connected, but we're gonna say left. If the left stick is pressed in the left direction, <clears throat> if they have a USB stick, but also we're gonna do this one more time and say if the, contr uh, oops, if the controller, the controller button, um button press if the controller one button press of left happens the d-pad in the left direction now if any of the left keys that we support are pressed and you could do the same thing here if you needed to add in support for um <clears throat> mobile you would add it right here as well if the mobile joystick is pressed in this direction move that so maybe i think there's a good time now for us to add the extension for mobile so we're going to continue with this um, and I'll, I'll, we'll add some overlays later on how to do mobile controls, but we're going to add the basic um, mobile key input. And uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's under like joysticks. Yeah, there we go. Multi-touch. And we don't want, don't select, okay, turn it, don't select the depreciated version for the love of everything. Make sure that when you click this, it's the sprite version. 
Okay. Please don't choose the depreciated. It says depreciated. It does not work. Don't do it. You'll be very upset because you won't understand why it's not working. This is why. Select Sprite. Thank you. All right. Now, even though we haven't added any, any mapping, right? We can go to mobile. Sorry, geez. Uh, we can go to uh, multi-touch. And we could identify what controller it is and all of that. But we can say if controller um, input joystick sprite buttons pressed. And if the multi-touch controller of one. And this is where we would identify the button by name, but we don't do that right now. Um, first, I need to set up uh, the objects for this actually to work. Now that I'm thinking about it, joystick pushed in four directions. Uh, this would work. This will work for now. So a multi-touch controller, we're going to say it's the first controller, the primary joystick, and if it's in the left direction. And we'll add that later. So now we have full controller support for the left direction. We're going to paste it and do everything for the right on this one. So just go in here, double click, and do right. And if you want, you could just copy that as well. It makes this easier um, if you are using text expressions, I guess. So if not... I guess copying it did absolutely nothing. Um, okay, so now when what happens is we have the option to start moving um, our our key input, right? So um, what what we're doing here is we don't want to do this trigger once because if we trigger it once, it it, it, all, it is only going to let us whenever we press the key, it's not going to continuously move. It'll only move us one time, one pixels worth of or one input worth of movement. We don't want that. You don't have to keep tapping the button to keep moving. So you don't need a, a you don't need any sort of condition other condition here. So if this is pressed, right, we can trigger on moving to the right or to the left. And so uh, we could say as well, as long as this key is pressed and none of these keys are pressed, then move. But for now we're going to keep it a little loose. So player, and now we can say simulate. So we're going to use the simulation uh, logic. So now that we added the platform or controls, we can use simulated control. A lot of different inputs here, but the easiest way to do this is just select. Rather than, you can do simulate control and manually select these, but this is the best way for now, is simulate left key press. Okay, of the platformer object. Anything that has the platformer object, do this thing. Okay, okay, easy. Copy this, paste it, and simulating the left press of toast. Instead, we're going to double click that and change it to the right direction. So now we have the controller format for the left and the right direction. So now if we pressed play or updated our game, went to it, if I use the left arrow or the right arrow, we can see that our player is moving left and right. That's awesome. We can see an acceleration, we can see a deacceleration, and that is kind of, it's themed in the Super Mario way. Let me make sure that this is big so you can see it. So now we can see that our character is sliding. Now, okay, we have an issue. Our player <laughs> has a uh, very interesting uh, loop. It's not working. The loop's not working. And that's because um, I didn't set a loop to the toasts uh, right here. So now we have a loop for the walk animation. Okay. So I want to change the speed of that just because if I run it right now, the character is going to go really fast, just like it was before. That's too fast. We're going to move this down to 10. For this game, 0 0.1 seems to work out fine. So we're going to hit apply. We're going to go check the game and we're going to check the keys. Okay. Our player is moving left and right. Look at this. Now we have this. Okay. So we have basic controls. No, no jump yet. And that's all right. Cause we're about to add the transition to jump. So in our move state, we want again, we want to transition out of our mood state. So we want to see if, if neither, uh, instead of uh, in the move state, we're going to duplicate this actually. And one of these is going to be called uh, jump state. And the other one is going to be called uh, idle because now we need to return to the idle, right? So first we're going to do idle. So in the idle script, we're moved it out of the or condition. And we said, uh, if this none of these keys are being pressed, but now we've added additional keys, right? So now we have to add 
all of these. So we can just copy each of them. And we can honestly just copy it like this, the whole, the whole thing. So as long as we're not grabbing any of the uh, or statements, we can copy all of this, paste it into here, and say as long as none of these keys, invert them, are being pressed, then go back to the idle state. That means if none of the left or right buttons are being pressed in any capacity, go to leave the move state and go back to idle. So we can interrupt that by adding a jump state and saying that if our our uh, if the jump key, and so we can now change keyboard to jump. So a jump key for the we don't have the joystick button yet, so we're going to use just the uh, button for the controller, and we can actually change this instead of using the button and selecting what button you want. We want to make it universal. So if you have a different controller, you could you could configure it to a different button. And this is where we start using those button keys. But we know that right is written the same way as it is on the keyboard and, uh, and with the capital. So now we can actually delete this, go into our globals, and we can configure these if, if, if you would like to use the up, down, left, right keys in the controller. Uh, you could add the child here and do exactly this. It happens happenstantially, it looks exactly like this. So the, we would have to say controller, um, you know, we controller down is the down key, right? Um, but in this case, we're going to be jumping, right? So jump, and we want the A key on um, your controller to be the jump key. Now, if it's a traditional Nintendo controller, it would be B, uh, A. A, B, A, B, A, no, A, it would be, uh, I have it right here, it would be B, yeah, uh, well, usually the bottom button, so in Mario, the bottom button is run, the B button is run, and A is jump, so we're going to keep A as jump, and if you're on a modern controller, this still works, A is a good key to jump, so A is the jump button, we're going to say apply, and now we can say that if the jump key is pressed, or duplicate this, the, not keyboard, but the controller jump key is pressed, we're going to transition to the jump stick. All right. And, and you can see that here we're not initializing the jump because the jump, the jump script needs to handle the jump, which is really nice about these transitions is be, if we're not in that current state, we can add this functionality to the next one. So if we are, for example, uh, in the jump state and we're on the ground. So after we jump, because we're going to go, hey, move to the jump state. Well, the jump state is going to say when we enter the state, jump. Jump immediately, like that's your job. Jump immediately, and as soon as you jump, we're gonna as it, once you leave that jump state, you're gonna start falling, and we need to then transition to that. But if you want player movement, for example, to be available while you're falling, then we need to add the actions of what you can do while you're in that state. So if we're in the walk state and we push these buttons, move our character. Well, we want that to be true when we're jumping and falling, so we will have to duplicate that script again. But we can just copy it out. Super easy. So an idle, same thing. So if we're if we're in the jump state and we fall and we transition to the fall state and then we transition into the floor the the idle state or when we fall we say when we touch the ground after we're in the fall then we transition back into the idle state. Very very interesting and it, it works very quickly and you know you can prototype this way super fast. So now that we have these two scripts we can minimize it basically. And in move right now, all we can do is idle and jump. Cool. Let's go to our jump script, just so we add the functionality. So every time we enter the jump script, we want to trigger something one time. And we know that we want to trigger, so once, once while true, we want to actually jump. We want to have our character jump. Um, and so we can, we can then go into this and either right now assign it to jump or we can check to see if our jump key is held down, then jump. Because we're transitioning. We already pressed the button. But in this case, we're going to trigger it one time, and we're going to say uh, jump, effectively. And it's to simulate the jump key. So just type jump, hit OK. So now we'll go into the jump state, but we won't transition. And rather than having to go to the debugger every single time that we want to check what our player state is, we're instead going to do something that I usually do at the beginning of the, when I develop something like this, but we'll do it now. 
and we add a text and we're going to call this debug uh, our player uh, debug state <clears throat> and we're going to set this to 14 pixels for now we're going to leave the font alone and we're going to leave it as text so we can add this to our game scene it's called text and now we want to change it so into our game our major game scene under the configuration i want you to uh always so we don't need a condition set the debug state text to we're going to use so we're going to be passing in strings and not strings so the way that this works is when you are writing a text expression and you have to write your string whatever's inside of the quotes right needs to be um the actual thing that you're going to see so right now if we what we what we know is that the text is actually just text right inside of the object so that's what that looks like if if we were to go back to the um the configuration of debug it would look like this so that, that's what that means now in this space keys even though they're blank blank uh text cubes they still count as a character which means if we leave a space in here it will add the space into our text so we're going to say uh player uh, we're just going to say state what's our player state so state colon space space again so space inside of this to add that space in our engine and then we're going to say plus so we're going to add another thing to this it's not a, a mathematical plus but we're saying include the next step the next step is to read the player's current state so we say um player uh or toast rather toast dot um <clears throat> and we're going to say state because we know that that's the the toast state so now what should happen if we run our game we see that we're in the idle state we see that we're in the move state and if i jump well my jump key's not working so because i can't jump from idle but i can jump while i'm moving and we saw that it it did that so if i go to my idle script now we see that we can only go to the move state so go to our move script copy our jump state and add it to the transitions of what we can do inside of our idle state now if i press preview again now i can jump we see it jump i jumped but we didn't actually jump right because when we transitioned into the state the jump didn't actually work so i need to see what happened there oh there we go okay so when we enter we do actually need that key input down so when we jump into the state we're going to copy this again and this is in, in our in our like actions right this would be an action um i'm going to copy this whole thing so this this would uh, we're going to say jump action would be inside of our action lists right now i've clearly ripped that apart like our uh the this format but that's okay um so now if this is true jump right so now we're jumping because i'm holding the key down and but i can't move in the jump state but i can jump but we we're not leaving the jump state after i press the jump key so now i have to include the the transitions so i'll, I'll grab our transitions and we'll go to jump and we'll just add them in so we don't need a jump transition but we do need an idle transition so technically if no key is being pressed, we should be idling. We're still jumping. What is that about? Well, because this condition is saying specifically, if all of these keys aren't pressed, then go to idle. But we could add also the jump keys to this variable structure. So we're going to actually organize this a little bit so it looks a little bit better. So we're going to put all of our right keys. So we're going to do each button. So button right, button left, joystick, left and right, and joystick button left stick in the left direction left stick in the right direction left right left right left right left right left right or left right so each of them are now organized so now if i'm holding the jump key we're still entering the idle state and it's is pressed right not is held down so these wouldn't actually work because this is that logic that's it uh, actually <laughs> i organized this so what i'm going to do now is copy this part out because I like the organization of this and we're going to move it into um, the idle or not sorry the move script idle so I'm going to delete all these now so I can have a nice little organized section here oops delete 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 come on come on come on come on come on stop doing this 
There we go. Now we're going to paste those in. Okay. That just looks more, more organized, more better. Going back to our jump script, we now see that when we press the jump button, we jump. But now idle is when we jump, okay, we then need to go to our, um, our script and say is on the floor. Because normally we would say is falling. But we don't have the falling script yet. So for now, we're going to say is on the floor, right? Just to test it. So if we're on the floor, what do we need to do? Well, we need to transition to the idle state. That's pretty straightforward. So now we can check and say jump, idle, jump, idle. Then it works. Left. And now our movement is not transitioning because I broke the movement script in the idle because uh, I was messing around. In the idle script. Ah, I lied. This needs to be... So whenever we're leaving a state, we need to trigger it one time. And that way... Uh, it resets every time we enter the state. Uh, so, or maybe not. Did I, what, what happened here? So moving. Okay, so I can move when I'm in the, wait. <laughs> what is happening? So jump key, idle doesn't, idle doesn't need one, but a key press does. So something that, let me see this. This should work. What the heck? Oh, duh. So movement doesn't need it, but jump needs it. I just explained that. So, and that was why before. So right now we're constantly in the idle state because what's actually happening is when we're in the idle state and we're on the, or when we, let's see, what is happening here? So this is why we do it this way, right? So if we're in the idle state and our keys left and right are being pressed, go to the move direction. Do that always. When jump is pressed, trigger this once. Don't trigger this. Let's, let's look at what is happening here. Jump, idle. Okay, so that's fine. Why is the left and right? Why? Go to our move state. Oh. Uh. This should be. Let me think here. Key. Um, keyboard? What's the any key pressed, any key released, key pressed, key released. Oh, I'm I'm thinking about clicks in my head. Uh, let me think that. Let me think this through. My brain had a had a malfunction. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, okay. We need to. There's a couple of things we need to do. Okay, so particularly for the move script. So we do need to um, when we transition to move. Right. So this is where I messed up. Uh, I explained this the wrong way. So when we transition from the idle state uh, specifically, so in the finite state machine and in idle, when we reach the idle state, the first thing we want to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and say, do this once. We're going to trigger this one time. So when we enter the idle state, if if our idle is not idle, do that. And then we're going to say, what can we what can we do in these actions? So we can, from idle, we can jump. We're actually going to move this up. I'm going to move this out. So what can we do? We can jump. Um, or we can reset our jumps. So this is a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to duplicate this. Oops. Can we, can we do this correctly, please, in one fluid motion? All right. So we're going to say... Uh, we're going to add some more variables uh, because I want to control this a little bit more. So we're going to disable these, turn these into inverse. So when we're not jumping, when we're not holding the key down and we're in idle, we want to reset our jump number as jumped, right? We're going to, we're actually going to change a, uh, 
uh, we're going to use a bool uh, not a boolean variable, but we're going to use an actual um, a number variable. So I'm going to go into because we're going to we're counting jumps in this case because maybe we want to change how many jumps we can do later on. And so right now I'm just going to go here and go rather than has has jumped. Um, well, well, we'll we'll do it like this. So even though has jumped sounds like a boolean, we're going to we are going to actually handle it like a boolean, but we can do it with a variable number too. So we're going to start with zero. OK, so every time we jump, we're going to add one to that to that list and it's going to be like our max has you know jump counter to max jumps but for now we're just gonna we're gonna cut that out and say specifically if we are not touching any keys and we're in the idle state then our our idols uh our our, our toasts number variable of has jumped is going to equal to uh zero sorry so if, if they haven't jumped at all don't do this now, if you wanted a dash state, you could do the same thing. If this is a dash, we're going to say reset jumps, reset dashes. So whenever you enter the idle state, you would reset those numbers. So, okay, we have that. We don't have any other things that we can do in this. So we're going to say um, if the player is, we could say if the player is on the floor in the idle state, but we don't need to because we already assume the player is on the floor. And we're going to say, um, if if all of these things are true and uh in this case we're going to disable the move state and say um or so if if the jump key is pressed and has jumped to zero so now we're going to add that that jump variable back into here so jump state so if the toasts um variable boolean uh has jumped and, sorry, number variable is equal to zero. So if we still have jumps left, effectively, if we still have jumps left and any key is pressed, then jump. And all we need to do, again, is transfer the state of our player into the jump state. And we want to make sure that we actually trigger the jump state once, okay? Because if not, it'll happen every time we hold the key down. And this will count really fast. We don't want to do that. So trigger it one time, okay, just in, in the idle. And we're going to do the same basic thing in the movement. So if we're moving left and right, or whatever the button combination there in is, and so we could add our controller keys in our move state, which effectively, right, if we go to our move state and we copy this, the both of these. So I'm going to copy all of, uh, all of this, actually. And we're going to say from the idle script, uh, if any of these are true. And so we're going to just delete these two and then copy all of these and invert them again back to regular. So now if any of these conditions are true and we can move, which means, you know, any key is pressed here, we're going to trigger this once. So when we're leaving, trigger once. And now we go into the move state and with us moving into the move state, we need to recheck our key bindings. Um, and so I'll, I'll do that here right now. Um, <clears throat> so inside of the player movement script, okay, if, if we're pressing left, now we're going to simulate the left key and then we're gonna trigger something once every time this happens. And the reason why we do this once is because if this key is being held down and pressed, you know, for any any duration, it's continuously moving to the left side. So what we want in this is, um, and we can do a trigger once while true here. We don't need to keep resetting the uh, walk animation. Sorry. So um, in this, we're going to use that flip that flip key that we added earlier to add a little bit of game feel. So flip the object, but I want to do um, we're going to flip it to a side. The uh, if we're going to the left, we're going to invert it, and we're going to do it over 120 milliseconds. And we're going to add the same condition, and we're going to add it to the bottom of this one. And if we're going to the right direction, we're going to say, no, don't flip it, or flip it back to the original direction. Okay? And we're going to, for now, leave our, all of our transitions. We are only going to be able to walk and move. But, but there is an issue. Why? My left and right key isn't working. 
this this should not be happening um I'm wondering, has something changed? Okay, we enter. What is happening here? We enter the idle state. So this is where the finite state machine. The whole point. Let me let me let me show you this. So clearly, right? We already can see in the text debugger that that's happening. But if we go into our toast, uh, we can see that they're in the idle state. They're stuck in the idle state. So we go back to the move. Um, when we leave the, we shouldn't be transitioning. Why are we not leaving? We're not leaving idle state. Um, I wonder if adding one of these had overwritten the control sequence it doesn't make sense so we can see the character turning but he's returning back to the idle state did i not save is that what happened uh g develop can we figure out what's going on here i'm confused <laughs> my own uh my own situation here and i'm confused because the Wait a minute. Let me go check my. Oh, that's why. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh man. Ah, okay. You could tell that I haven't slept very well recently. So when we enter the jump state, uh, this is silly of me. This was very obvious. Um, but this is why we do what we do, right? So what happened was the jump state was always running. So I just turned it off, but well, the jump state was causing us to go back to the idle state. And I was, I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense because our movement script was working just fine and I disabled everything. So we're going to go back to our move and we're going to re-enable all of this glorious stuff and say, okay, now when we move left and right, this works. When we jump, this works. Okay. So now jumping, of course, is the spot where we break and that's where we know our code is actually working. So <clears throat> in the walk, I was like, yeah, dude, my pro my program is perfect. Like, I, I don't understand. Um, we're going to go to jump in the jump state. If the jump key is there, we can jump. So now what we're going to do is actually in our idle, in our uh, or in our jump rather, so finite state machine jump. We need to change, of course, the very beginning. We're going to do the nice little trigger. So if we are not in the, we don't have it yet in that in that state, then transition into that state. And uh, what we wanna do is then check if, if the key is being pressed, we're gonna jump and then we're gonna change the toast variable uh, of, the, of the number um, uh, or the number variable of has jumped equals to one. So we're counting the jumps. So we're adding or setting it to one in this case. Um, and that'll happen immediately and that's fine. We don't need to, uh, to set it to, uh, plus one, or we'd need some sort of trigger loop, but this is fine. It does effectively the same thing as simulate the jump and set the jump key to one. And then we want to move to player movement. That's another thing that we can do while we're in the actions. So transitions again is how we move out of the state. Um, and we'll we'll go check for an idle here in a second. But so for the jump, um, we're going to go back to move, and we're going to take the player movement script, and we're going to add it into the jump state. Because again, remember guys, every time we do something, so we're going to create a new event group. We're going to call it actions, so you guys can follow. Oops, my goodness. Actions. We're going to move the uh, the jump and the player movement into their own action scripts and then transitions. So now now we say, OK, now if the toast is on the floor. Then set our state and we're going to just change our state real quick. Um, we, we don't want to transition to the move state while we're jumping because move state 
Uh, this is the only time where we're going to do this. We're going to add the move state to our jump and our fall independently because we still, while we're falling, we don't want to leave the state while we're correcting our falling direction. Um, and that's why we do it this way. Otherwise, you get back to the move state and then back to the falling state and back to move, back to fall. And we don't want the animation for walking to happen in that time. Uh, and so we're going to add, of course, it says walking now, but we're going to change that here in just a second. And we're going to go back to the, um, I'm just going to copy the transition uh, text for this one. And we're going to say um, in the jump state, if we're on the floor, do this one time. And uh, yeah, because we're leaving. So anytime we leave, trigger once. And now we should have jump and move and a jump and a jump. And so when we jump, we're seeing that we're staying in the idle state, which is weird. Um, so let's go back to our jump state. And if the toast is on the floor and um, in this case, I want to say um, we're going to lean into the uh, we're going to, um, give me a second here. I'm going to just copy this over uh, to make it very, very straightforward. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to add the group called idle. And I'm just going to paste that in here. So we're going to change the player to toast. Um, and you can see what I'm doing here. Um, I'll show you. Uh, toast, we're not going to have it. Yeah. So what we did here is say, if we're jumping, right? and for some reason, we don't fall. Maybe we hit the ground too fast, so we can't transition to fall. We're creating a backup. And um, I want to take this idle and move it into here. So now we have an idle script. So if the animation is jump and the animation has finished, which means we played through the animation and then we're on the floor, go to idle rather than immediately go to idle because we want the animation to finish. So we don't have the jump animation yet, so we're going to fix that. We're going to fix that by, um... <coughs> oh man, choking. Um, let me drink. So we're going to we're going to fix the idle um, animation or the jump animation. So the jump animation for me is the build up these three and then the actual jump. So normally, we well, we have this really cool version where we like, our character bends down and um, and gets shadow. So we're actually gonna do this whole thing. So this is the jump animation. And, uh, and then, or to here, sorry, it's this one, okay. So the jump animation is these five, and then the fall animation is these four. So, so technically it's four to jump, four to fall, and then we have a plop. Like maybe the, so this one looks like the character sleeping. Um, it looks kind of like he's like laying on the ground and breathing, but here you can see the, the full animation because we will be in some frame that looks like this, whether we're running or in idle. So we can use just these four. So we're going to go to our, um jump which went to our berry but we're going to call this one jump and we're going to set the animation to these four okay there's our jump animation now so file export uh animation we're going to do jump go to our toast we're going to create a new folder and call it jump beautiful and it might as well make uh the fall i i call it flop but we're going to call it fall now so walk Let's do walk or uh, jump first, jump, save, jump, one, two, three, you know, same thing as before. So there's that. And then we can very easily just now change this to our flop. And then I'm going to change the animation title from flop to fall. Okay. And then now we can just select, uh, well, we will when I uh, export again, go to animations. Now we have fall and just like everything else. Go to the right folder, save it, and save here. Okay. Oops. Five. No, 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 Don't do that. Four. Do this. This is now fall. We don't need that transition. We need this transition. Uh, yeah. 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 Let's do that. 
And then we're going to go into that toast folder. And uh, you're, you guys can't see it right now, but I I'm going to delete the um, extra frame in the fall animation. I don't want that, uh, that frame. So we just got to have the four in each of them. That's very traditional. Just four frames. That's all we get when we're working in a, in a game like this. So um, we don't need to overwrite that. So now we have the sprites we need. Um, and again, for you, you can just import these now from uh, the folders that I'll have in the download section. So you go to Toast, go to a new animation, call this Jump, and then add sprites. We're going to go to our jumping sprites and say Jump is all four frames. And then um, these we're going to do at the same time scale, but we're not going to loop it because we want it to finish. If you do a finish, it has to stop. Yeah, somewhere. It has to stop somewhere. And we're going to add this one and do fall in the same way. Add the fall sprites, go to jump, go to fall, add all four of them. And they'll import in the right order as long as you, uh, yeah. And so the same thing, set it to this. Don't loop it because you're just going to fall one time. All right, perfect. Now, eventually we're going to need to address the collisions and the spawning location. So for now, we're going to add the point. And for all of our sprite, we're going to put the bottom origin of our character in the center, right below the center marker. And um, we're going to change this actually to like 8, yeah, 8.5 uh, 8 by 16.5, which is the true middle, true middle. Um, and uh, this can just be 16. That's fine. And the center, we're going to fix this and do 8.5 by 8.5 because this is a 16 by 16. So we want the true center of this character. Um, which is a, a, a fraction, unfortunately, or is a, is a halfway position, because if, if it is 16 by 16 and 8 is in this direction, 8 is in this direction, then 8.5 is between everything, if you think about it that way. For there's four cubes that makes up, that are 8 by 8 to make 16 by 16. So we can do that for now. And we'll hit close, apply. So now our character has the ability to, uh, nothing's really changed here. We have the movement. We have the jump, and we have, well, that's it. So now um, that we have the animation, we can now go back into our jump script, change walk to jump, and there. So now if the animation isn't jump and we're jumping, we'll change the animation. Cool. Well, we have an issue. Uh, we're not leaving the jump state. So after we jump, we're not going to idle. So if the animation is jump, and it's finished, and we're on the floor. Let me go check the... Uh, that. So a collision could be causing this issue. So now that I changed the origin point, the collision of our character in the jump position in the final frame could be borked. And in this case, eh, I, I'm not a huge fan of where that collision box actually is. So we're going to change that just a smidge. And now, uh, jump, no loop, fall, no loop. Let's see what happens here. So jump, the animation is jump, and it's finished, and we're on the floor. Change the idle position. So jump, but we're not transitioning as we should. Why? Why is this? Why is this? Why did this happen? Stuff in here. Maybe I need to reconfigure this as jump. Maybe I got like mixed up. Let's sometimes when you import something like that. Okay, so that didn't work. So if we're on the floor, trying to just be idle, that's true always. Nope, that still didn't work. Hmm. Let me think about this. just revisiting our states here. So we have, let's check this out. So we have our jump state. 
if jump is zero, go to jump. Um, and as soon as we enter the idle state, we reset our jump. So if we're not holding the jump key at any point in time, trigger this. Okay. Um, fine it's our jump state something with our jump state well normally i would transition into a fall state uh but let me finish looking at this real fast okay um yeah why why, why this why is this not working so when we leave our jump state if the animation is jump is finished change the the text to idle trigger this one time that that should be working mm. has jumped move jump so if we are if we yeah. are falling i think we need to just transition uh to the fall state oh that's why no nope, that's why i transferred this over and uh this is supposed to be um the variable here uh, needs because I was using a uh, player state before, but now it's state. Uh, that was that was an easy fix. Okay, my bad. So so now we need to fix that origin point. Uh, that was uh, I shouldn't have changed that at all. Um, or the uh, the collision mask. So now we can. I forgot I changed when I did this. I changed it for all of us. Normally, if you want to change it for a specific sprite, you have to turn this off. Um, and go through the animation and change it. But I didn't do that, so I messed all that up. So we're just gonna set it back to normal. And now when we jump and we move, right, we have uh, the basics of our of our engine. So we have the jump move, we have the idle, the walking, and now we can add in the fall, right? Um, so we can't, we have to hold jump. We can't hit press jump more than once, which is kind of cool. So even if we held the jump key down uh, and we moved into idle, and now I want to say when we're in the idle state and we're not, uh, when we transition it into the idle state, if uh, we can change this from key pressed to released, if the key hasn't been released, so if we're still holding it down, if we're still holding the button down, or if, if, if it's released, yeah, yeah, so let me fix this. So if the key is released, then change it here. But if we're still holding the key, don't do that, right? So it's waiting for us to, to change that key. Uh, that still didn't work. Let's, let's fix this. Uh, when, let me go backwards. Let me make sure I, I think about this right. So when key is pressed, uh, so when the key isn't pressed reset to zero if it is pressed we need to make another one of these so if it is being pressed uh keep keep it at one we need to make sure that you let go of it no nope, it did the jump again why is this it's registering has jumped to zero if key isn't pressed, okay, so if key isn't pressed, set jump to zero. Uh, and then let's go to our, our, our jump state, I think. And we want to make sure in our jump action that we have to make sure that jump is set to zero in our jump action, because if it's not set to zero, um, it, it will jump again. Right. Uh, I believe that is the issue. So we go back into our jump and say, if has jumped is zero and we jump, set it to this. And then if not, it, there we go. So now every time we jump, you have to press space bar every, every time. Yeah. But it's also, it's also stopping us from being able to jump higher. So if it's zero and the jump key is pressed, do this. 
Um, keep that going. And then... Uh, when we touch the ground, we're going to change it to, uh, because basically if we have it, if we can't, if we can jump, right, jump. But what's happening is it, by the time we get back into the idle and it transitions again, it, it shouldn't reset because we're holding the button down. Uh, so I don't, so this is what's happening, right? So we're able to hold the key down to get that air time, but then we can hold the key constantly and constantly jump, but we want to jump once, right? So we have to say that when we're jumping, when we enter the jump state again, and oops, we're gonna move. When we jump into the jump state again, and if it's zero, simulate, and if it's one, do, do nothing, right? Effectively, but that's the same thing as just leaving this blank. And then, we do need to change this to one, I guess, because then, and then simulate. Oh, I think I just had in the, the wrong order. So if the has jump for the toast, we're going to set that to one and then simulate the jump. Maybe? No, no, that's not right. I think it does the same thing. Hmm. This is interesting. I'm going to have to think about how to, because as soon as we jump, right, we enter a state where it cuts our ability to jump off because we're still holding the button. So now I need to do this. And if we're still going to simulate the button press at zero or at one, But then when we get back to the state, it's going to allow us to jump again. Hmm. Well, when we hit idle, it's allowing us to jump one more time. So we need to fix that. So this is right. This part's right. I think. When we jump. We want to allow more air time. Because now we can't jump very high. <laughs> but normally, uh, when we jump in Mario, we get a little bit more height out of our hold time. And I'm wondering now if I can fix that by increasing the hold time, or if it truly is just cutting me off. No, the, the jump sustain. No, it's truly just cutting me off. Okay. So I need to think about how to address the functionality of making sure that we can jump. So if, oh, there we go. We'll see, but then at the end, we're getting that second jump. So when we hit jump one, if the key is pressed, go back to idle. Ah. Um, uh, we need the, uh, Where's that? This. We need this up here as well. So if the variable is one and there's no key being pressed, then set it to zero. And if there is, don't do anything. No, what? what? Come on. Don't do me dirty like this. If it's one and the key is isn't pressed, set it to zero. And if has jumped is zero, jump again. But so that just allows us to infinitely jump. And then this allows us to jump once. But
Um, hmm. This is interesting. I think it has to do with this, right? If, oh, yeah, but then it cuts, again, it cuts off the, the jump time. Hmm. If toast can jump i don't know if that can jump can you jump if you can jump but that might be uh now it adds an another jump this is interesting so somewhere in here i have a double jump that's happening and i think it's in the move script actually so I think I need to add has jumped into move as well. Because I think if I move at all, it resets the jump capacity. And I don't want it to do that. Ah, well, okay, whatever. We're going to deal with this double weird bounce thing that's going on. So if you hold the jump key down, this will happen. But if you just press it once, it gives you control over the height. Um, I think it's weird that there's like a bounce, but that's okay. <laughs> I think that's because we're not going into the fall state. And when we go into the fall state, we'll be able to fix that. So the idle, it's, it's kind of causing a, a circular glitch, um, I believe. So um, now we can, so now that we have the basics here in the movement mechanics and all of that good stuff, um, I think that uh, the next step would be, let's see, um, movement control, jump move, find a state machine, uh, we could yeah do the fall mechanic now, so fall. And then we'll be done with the base finite state machine mechanics. And I think that that will be good for um, this part of the video. Again, I, what I want to do is reiterate over what we already know and transition this, this, this program um, into a fully featured demo. But what I need to do is finish exporting everything. And I think it'd be very boring, very, very boring for you guys to watch me go through each each export and do that. So I think that before we continue any farther in this little tutorial series, uh, what I want to do is transition that um, into uh, doing all the exports. Um, or, or I mean, I guess it's up to you guys. If you do, you want to see the the transition of importing everything and adding it, organizing it, because that sounds kind of boring. But at the same time. If you haven't watched my other videos, this would be a great time to learn this skill. So I'm kind of debating about what's the right thing to do. Um, let me know. Let me know. Um, in the meantime, while that's happening, we're going to go back to our jump. And we're going to say, um, in idle, uh, instead of while we're jumping, we're going to go fall. And if the animation is jump and it's finished, and the toast is uh, falling, is falling, then transition to fall. Yeah, basic, very straightforward. Um, and then what we're going to do is go into um, the next, let's see, the next section here. Um, let's see. Um, lost track of my file. There we go. Um, jump transitioning into fall. Of course. Remy, thank you for hanging out, man. I really appreciate it. Enjoy your movie time. Okay, so when we transition, transition to the fall state, and then we're going to go into our fall state now and configure the... Uh, configure that so fault choose a scene game scene and then we're going to copy the player movement right so actions we're just going to copy all this go back in here paste it so now we have the actions of we can move while we're falling and um for now we can jump while we're falling and the importance of this actually um so this is what we can do. And then now we're going to go into our transitions 
And so while we're transitioning in our false state, so that if we run off of a ledge, for example, in our game, and we in and that causes us to um, go into a, a false state, basically, right? So if we're already in the false state and we can jump, we want to jump again. So now we can go back into the jump mechanic, do it from the idle state. So grab the, the transition of jump, go into fall and say, instead of here, we're going to say jump state, jump state transition. And now inside of the jump state, if we are, uh, if we're falling and we haven't jumped, jump, we are allowed to jump. We could do that, right? And then, uh, oh, here we want to add the idle uh, false state, which or the idle state, which was also uh, present in the jump state, just in case. Uh, and this is really where we transition back to idle rather than in the jump state. So now we can go back to the top of any script and say, okay, if we're in the false state, every time we go into the false state, trigger the whole jump the animation of fall and change the animation to fall so if we're not, not if we're not falling fall and if we finally touch the floor and fall is complete um then then go into idle so let's check it out jump and so we can see there there was a transition where of course the fall is taking place and it wants us to finish the fall animation when we touch the ground because it's not happening in the air right so what we need to do is is uh, when we jump uh, in the jump state or uh, in the fall, let's see, in the false state. Let's see here. Uh, huh. Let's see. Trigger once. Uh, trigger the fall animation as soon as we enter fall state. And we want to not wait uh, in the jump here so we're not going to wait for the fall state the jump to finish actually we're just going to say if we are jumping right if, if 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 we're falling transition to fall like we don't have a choice there we go so now again because of how we jump and the animation timing we're struggling a little bit with uh getting into the animation of the fall it's not happening as fast as we need it to so we need to go back to our fall state and at one change the um collision and because it's colliding a way further down than it should be so we're going to say if we're falling uh enter the fall state and then in fall if we're falling and we touch the floor then transition back into the idle so now we have a smoother in if it doesn't get to all of it then that's okay but what i also want to do is go into our toast and go into our collision masks go to the fall animation and turn this off this part off we're going to turn this part off collision masks with all animations we don't want that we want it to be different for the the jump right so or in the fall so when we're falling we want the character to reach uh the point of the final frame if we can and and by moving the the collision we kind of see uh, where it'll collide with the ground before it switches back to the next one. So let's see if we can do that right. And there we go. We have a little bit of a bounce transition because it hits the ground and then it kind of bounces back up, which gives us a little bit of character feel. Um, so now we have our run, our jumps. Um, and let's see. And now we also want to um, it, uh, move the, the, if I'm holding the jump key, it's still, it's still not, you have to let go of the jump key because uh, you have to enter the idle state, right? So if you're still holding the jump key after moving and everything, it doesn't reset because you're still holding the jump key. So you need to make sure that you let go of it. And now we stop that double jump feature too. You guys noticed we don't have that weird transition now where the idle will jump again. So now we fix that. And now we have the basic player movement in a finite state machine. So that's how you do finite state machines and that's how you organize them. And we're gonna be using this technique throughout the entirety of this process. So this is just the player's uh, engine. Each enemy will have a, an engine like this. 
and uh yeah it just keeps it organized and as you saw in real time sometimes you know errors happen and we got to figure out how to do that um uh, a couple other things that i want to do is add some more characteristic to this this player so we're not quite out of the state machine yet um i have the crouch or the down and the climb mechanic to still introduce so um yeah let's see here um so actually i think i think this is a perfect place we're gonna we're gonna stop here and this will be a new video for people to check out but this is me transitioning this. I'm only going to be recording this in live stream, so that way I can do an edit of, of like the, the, the complete thing. But before I continue, I really do want you all to have the sprites so you can work alongside me to make this engine the rest of the way. So for now, we're going to end here. And uh, in, in the next video, uh, later when you go to see this video, you'll have the sprites for the complete set of what we're going to do next in this video as well as in the next video and i'll make sure that i annotate the um i put a little a, a part one part two in the live stream so that way you can see what we're doing and what it is so i'm gonna update the the thumbnail later but we have the basics of our move mechanics this is the base of if you add this to the to the template that i told you about before the um breaking this stuff down what we've done today is done the bottom piece and the player and now in the next video we're going to do the top pieces and maybe even some enemies and and terrain generation and how we go about making levels and that sort of thing so thank you so much for stopping in and hanging out in this video i've got some other things i gotta get to so we're gonna go ahead and pause it here again you guys are awesome don't forget to like comment and subscribe of course please and uh you know I'll see you in the next video.